as I said, two sets of accounting standards. So the next question that arises is, which companies are going to follow the NDS and which companies will follow the other accounting standards? So we are saying that there are two sets of AS. One, as I said, it is rules 2006. Another is rules 2015. We know that the accounting standards are now notified under the Companies Act. So we are basically discussing with reference to the companies that which company will follow which set of financial statements. NDS has been introduced doesn't mean that now existing AS has no future. The now existing AS over a period of time will be withdrawn and no one will follow that. No such thing is there. This end AS which has been issued, this rules 2015, which we refer as end AS, this we will refer as the existing AS. So you have these two sets. For this end AS, a road map has been given. So the companies which are getting covered as per this road map, these are the companies which are going to follow the end AS. The companies which are not covered in the road map, those companies will keep on following the existing accounting standards. Although the road map is suggesting that voluntarily any company can adopt NDAS, voluntarily it can be done by any company. But we know it is India, and in India things don't happen voluntarily, right? We know that thing very well. Actually, the NDAS was brought from 1st April 15. And the roadmap itself says that from 1st April 15, voluntarily start following NDS. Not a single company went for it. Everyone went for the mandatory application of the NDS. So as we say, there's a roadmap given. As per that roadmap, whatever companies are getting covered, they have no choice. Those companies have to follow the NDS. And whatever companies are left out, See, they also need accounting standards. You can't say I'm not following NDS. If you are not following NDS, follow the existing accounting standards. So it's not that, that the existing accounting standards have been withdrawn. The existing accounting standards are very much there. Even in future also, there is no plan of withdrawing the existing AS. Both the sets of accounting standards will coexist. You know what will happen very soon now? If you are planning an audit of some company, for example, you will have to first figure out that what is the nature of this company and then you will have to figure out whether this company will be following the existing AS or whether it be following the end AS. You know, very soon you will be aware of both. You will know existing AS also and you, you will be also knowing the end AS also. It should not happen that you start doing audit of some company and then you start giving, you know, instructions to the accountant on, on the basis of end AS. That this is how things are needed to be done. Why are you not doing it in this way? And finally, that accountant will tell us that NDS is not applicable to us. We have to follow existing AS. Think about our position at that time. You know, you will just put yourself in a very embarrassing situation where you are giving directions to the accountant on the basis of the NDS. So whenever you will plan your next audit, very soon this is what will really happen. You will have to first find out what is the net worth of that company. On the basis of that, you will have to decide whether it will follow existing AS, is it following the end AS, and that's how the entire audit function needs to be planned. And then, applying our understanding of the end AS or the existing AS, will have to carry out the audit function. Similarly, if you are in the accounts department, the same thing has to be also done by us. Is this company going to follow the existing AS, or is it going to follow the end AS? So let's be clear now with what companies will follow the NDS and for that the Ministry of Corporate Affairs have come out with a road map and as per that road map there are certain companies which are given no choice. Those companies have to follow the Indian accounting standards. Companies not covered, they have a choice. Either you voluntarily go for NDS or you keep on following your existing accounting standards. I'll also tell you something else which is actually going on right now. What the institute has now really started doing is, 
it has started updating even the existing AS. Now, this is a new project which has now started in India. Existing AS, the institute is now updating them. Not only that, the serial numbers will also going to change. We are going to have the same serial numbers. For example, right now when we say accounting standard 10, we understand that as accounting for fixed assets. And the parallel end AS is end AS 16. So, the first thing that the institute has done now is, we have introduced accounting standard 16. And this accounting standard 16 is not borrowing cost. This accounting standard 16 is property, plant and equipment, which will actually deal with fixed assets. So, very soon this confusion will also go away. Serial numbers of the existing AS and the serial numbers of the end AS, both will match. And more or less we will have similar accounting system. For example, this accounting standard 10, which just got recently revised, it is exactly based on the end AS. So, whether you study end AS or whether you study the accounting standard, both are same. So, gradually we are now removing even the differences which are there between existing AS and the end AS. Still some differences will be left, but majority of the differences will be taken care of. But that was a side topic. This is something which is actually going to happen in future. As of now, let's try to understand what exactly is the end AS roadmap. Which companies will follow the end AS? It's there in your books. We will just go through the same. See, in the roadmap, we are classifying the companies into two first, whether it's a listed company or whether it is a unlisted company. And then they will put a condition based on net worth. So, we first segregate the companies into two. And then we discuss it on the basis of the net worth of that company. So, if you will just look at first is the phase one. Basically, what we are discussing is a little bit of history now because all these dates have already passed by. The first date was of course, first April 15. So, the Roadmap suggested that voluntarily you start following the end AS, but that hardly happened. So, it started basically with 1st April 16. So, the net worth, right, if you are suggesting 1st April 16, whether it's a listed company, unlisted company, your net worth should be 500 crores or more. So, that was the starting point. So, we are suggesting that it is 500 crores or more. So, any listed company which has a net worth of 500 crores or more or any unlisted company which has a net worth of 500 crores or more, these companies should start following the NDS. In Indian context, 500 crores is a huge amount. So, basically we are talking about large companies, large listed companies and large unlisted companies. So, that was the first date, 1st April 16. So, if you just check over there. They are saying companies whose equity shares or debt securities are listed on stock exchange in or outside India and having a net worth of 500 crores or more. They use the words equity shares as well as debt security. So, it's quite possible that your equity shares are not listed, but maybe a debt security is listed. Still, for the purpose of India's roadmap, you will be considered as a listed company and you will have to follow the India. What's the condition? Net worth of 500 crores or more. What exactly is there in the net worth? We will come to that also. For the moment, we are saying if your net worth is 500 crores or more, follow NDS. Same condition for unlisted companies. Unlisted companies having net worth of 500 crores or more. So, we are putting the same net worth condition, 500 crores or more. Not only that, if this listed company or unlisted company has a subsidiary, if you have an associate, if you have a joint venture or you are having a holding company, a parent company, then even those companies will also have to follow the end AS. See, we want the entire group of company to follow same set of financial statements. We don't want a situation where parent is saying I'll follow end AS and subsidiary is saying that no, I will follow existing AS. We don't want that system. 
So, what will happen is whether it is a parent company or the subsidiary company or even associate, even joint venture, they are all going to follow the end year. So, that is the third one that they put holding, subsidiary, joint venture or associate companies of above listed or unlisted companies. So, everyone will follow the end years. For example, let us say there is company A, this company is let us say unlisted company and let us say its net worth is only 10 crores, let us say and it is having 80 percent shares in company B. This company B is listed and it is having a net worth of let us say 600 crores. So, we are trying to cover this kind of a situation. Company B is listed. What is its net worth? 600 crores. So, will it get covered in phase 1? Answer is yes. So, company B will have to follow end AS. From when? From 1st April 16. So, company B will follow end AS. If company B follows end AS, automatically its parent also has to follow the end AS. So, when I see over here, parent A is unlisted. So, I check over here that the company is unlisted. Then I look at the net worth. The net worth is less than 500 crores. Still, it will have to follow the end AS because your subsidiary is following the end AS. So, the entire group is required to follow the end AS. Not only that, let us say this company B, it has 25 percent shares in C. This C is again turning out to be unlisted. Let us say its net worth is only 120 crores, let us say. So, this is what we get. So, you are having an associate company now, right? With 25 percent, C will become an associate. Question is, what accounting system or what accounting standard should company C follow? What do you say? B is following NDS. So, B's parent has to follow NDS. B's associate also has to follow the NDS. So, every company which is associated with you, everyone has to follow the Indian accounting standard. Comfortable with this? So, we are saying that net worth is now not important because in A we are saying net worth, it should be listed. In B we are saying unlisted, again net worth while in C net worth is not important. If you are having a holding company or a subsidiary or an associate or a joint venture, in this if any one company follows end AS, everyone else will also start following the end AS. Then comes phase 2, that is 1st April 17. Yes, what is the case over here? We again look at the net worth. Here there is a slight difference between listed and unlisted. When it comes to phase 2, which is from 1st April 17, they are saying any listed company having a net worth of less than 500 crores. So, we say here rupees 500 crores or less. What does that mean? Every listed company has to follow end AS. So, 1st April 17, every listed company, whether your equity share is listed or debt security, that does not matter. If it is a listed company, it has to start following the end. So, if I talk about 1st April 18 now, for example. So, 1st April 18, how would I judge on 1st April 18? I have to simply ask a simple question. Are you a listed company? They say, yes, we are listed. Automatically, I know you have to follow the end years. Net worth does not matter. I have just started my company, it has a net worth of just few crores of rupees, does not matter. Are you listed? Answer is yes, you have to go for the end AS. So, end AS is compulsorily to be followed by every listed company. This is not done for unlisted company. For unlisted company, we have put one other criteria, we say it is 250 crores. So, rupees 250 crores. So, if your net worth is less than 500 crores, but not less than 250 crores, then you are supposed to follow the end AS. So, if it is less than 250 crores, I am not supposed to follow the end AS. So, that is what we do for the unlisted firms. So, in phase 2, 1st April 17, they are saying unlisted companies having net worth of 250 crores or more, but less than 500 crores. 
So here I'm putting a range, 250 to 500. So all these unlisted companies, they will follow the end year. So if we are doing, let's say if we are planning an audit of a private limited company, this private limited company obviously is unlisted. Again, we are further assuming that this private limited company does not have any subsidiary, any parent, any associate, any joint venture, which is not following end air. In short, let's say it is a standalone private limited company. The standalone private limited company is having a net worth of, let's say, less than 250 crore. Then this private limited company will not follow the end air. What will they follow? The existing years, right? It doesn't mean that they will not follow any accounting standard. They will follow, but they will follow the existing accounting standard. Unless and until the management of this company decides, you know, to become a hero, voluntarily, we will follow the end years. Fine. If you are voluntarily following the end years, no one will stop you. But I don't believe any private limited company will decide voluntarily to follow the end years. So in that event, they will keep on following the existing accounting standard, right? So that C is still there over here, holding subsidiary joint venture or associate companies of above listed or unlisted companies. As far as this illustration that we were looking at, where this company is unlisted, unlisted, please don't apply over here that phase two understanding that the net worth is less than 250. No, as we have made it very clear, if you are subsidiary of a company which is following end AS, then you have to follow end AS. Whether you are unlisted, doesn't matter. We are talking about standalone entities over here. And if you are a standalone private limited company, and if you'll try to visualize a lot many companies that we are auditing, you know, majority of the companies that we do audit do turn out to be private limited companies. And they may have a net worth of less than 250 crore and they may be mostly standalone entities then these companies they are going to follow the regular or the existing accounting standard everyone comfortable till here so very quickly if we just try to understand or rather recall the entire road map the first date was first april 15 where you are supposed to voluntarily follow india's that date has already gone by and no one really volunteered to follow the NDS. Phase 1 started from 1st April 16. Phase 1, if you are a listed company, unlisted company, doesn't matter, your net worth should be 500 crores or more, right? So 500 crores or more and you will have to follow the end years. Phase 2, 1st April 17, listed company, all listed companies have to follow the end years. And what about the unlisted companies? The net worth should be 250 crores or more, but less than 500 because if it was more than 500, you are already covered in the phase one. So insofar as unlisted companies are considered, it's very much possible that you still have unlisted companies which are not following NDS. They are actually following the existing accounting standard. Having said this, if you look at the structure of the group, parent, subsidiary, associate, joint venture, any one of them is following end years, then everyone else will also follow end years. At that time, don't check with net worth. That's the point that I'm constantly trying to make. So when one company follows end years, then you are not supposed to check with the net worth. You cannot argue my net worth is less, so I will not follow end years. Is your parent following end years? Is your subsidiary following NDS? Is your associate following NDS? Is your joint venture following NDS? If the question, uh, if the answer to this question, any of this question is yes, then everyone will have to follow the end years. Comfortable with this? Now there are a few typical situations which can arise. So we just try to discuss even that. Let us say we have company A. It's a listed company. So automatically it will start following the end AS, right? So we are saying that we are already covered in phase two. So under phase two, every listed company is following the end AS. Let us say this company has 90% shares in B and this company B 
is a foreign company. So it is, let's say, a foreign company. It is headquartered, let us say, in some overseas country. So we just want to know now how end AF mechanism will really work. So here one thing is clear, A is a listed company, it will follow NDS and as per our road map, if you are a listed company following NDS and if you have a subsidiary, then the subsidiary should also follow the NDS. So what will we do with this foreign company? Here we will have to distinguish between separate financial statements and consolidated financial statements. We know that when you have a subsidiary, you are also going to prepare CFS, right? You are going to prepare a consolidated financial statements. Let us say this foreign company, it is actually in UK. Now, if you are headquartered in UK, obviously you have to follow the laws of that country. See, this is end AS. End AS means Indian accounting standards. That means our jurisdiction is India. Right, you cannot force even foreign companies to start following the NDAs. So that is not possible. So when it will prepare its separate books, separate books it will prepare as per IFRS. You are based in UK, so obviously you have to follow the accounting standards which are forced in UK. So in UK, let us say it is IFRS which is in force. So this particular company will prepare its separate financial statements as per IFRS. Then a day will come when A will consolidate with B. Now when A will consolidate with B, at that time we will ask our subsidiary to prepare another set of financial statements which are confirming with the end AS. So in CFS, this company will have to follow the end AS. So in separate books, let the foreign company follow IFRS, no issue with that. But when you are carrying out consolidation, the main parent has prepared as per NDS and your subsidiary has prepared as per IFRS. Now these two financial statements cannot be consolidated. We will require same set of financial statements. So what shall we do? We will ask the subsidiary that you redraft your financial statements solely purpose of consolidation. So solely for the purpose of consolidation, it will prepare another set of financial statements and that will be in conformity with the end AS. And then we will carry out the consolidation. So since your parent was following end AS, as far as CFS is considered, the foreign subsidiary also has to follow the end AS. Fine. Let's see the other way around. What if it is the other way around? For example, you are having company A. It has 90% shares, let's say, in B. Let us say B is an Indian company, while my parent, my parent is a foreign company. So let's put it in this way. And this Indian company, let's further assume it is listed. Now, because it is listed, of course, it will have to follow the end AS, right? So a listed company, it is going to follow the end AS. So my company B is following end AS but my parent is a foreign company. Again, understand, the jurisdiction of end AS is limited to India. This company, which is based in UK, I cannot ask this foreign company to prepare its financial statements as per end AS. So this foreign company will keep on preparing its financial statements as per the laws which are in force over there. Let's assume it is IFRS. So this foreign company will prepare as per IFRS, while company B will not prepare as per IFRS. Company B is Indian company. If it is an Indian company, the accounting standard rules 2015 are applicable to it. So it has to follow the end AS. So we'll have a typical situation where parent will prepare as per IFRS, while the subsidiary will prepare as per the end AS. What will happen in consolidation? It will be the other way around this time. So when consolidation will happen, this foreign company will now ask B2 redraft its financial statements as per IFRS and then they will carry out the consolidation. But as far as the separate financial statements of company B is considered, because company B is an Indian company and because it is also listed, it has to follow the Indian accounting standards. So, 
this is what will happen if you are having a foreign parent. So the two cases are a bit different. If your subsidiary is a foreign company, I can force the subsidiary to follow end heirs. But if my parent is, right, if my parent company is a foreign company, the subsidiary cannot ask the foreign company to prepare as per end heirs. So foreign company will continue as per its accounting standards, while the subsidiary will prepare as per its own set of financial statements. Fine with it? Yes, let's take one more typical situation, that same case of foreign company. Let us say A is a foreign company. Let's say it is having two subsidiaries this time. Let's say 80 and 70 percent shares you are having in B, 70 percent shares in C. Let's say both of them are Indian companies. This is listed. This is unlisted. If you look at the net worth, it is listed. It's not important, but still let's say it has a net worth of 600 crores. And this is unlisted. Here, net worth is important. Let's say it has a net worth of 120 crores. So, in this situation, we want to now understand what sets of accounting standards will be followed. So, let's start with this foreign company. Let's assume again it's somewhere in the European Union. So, what shall it follow? IFRS, it's a foreign company, it has nothing to do with the Indian accounting standards. So, it's following the IFRS. Please help me out over here. Company B is a listed company having a net worth of 600 crores. What should you follow? End AS, right. So, you are going to follow end AS over here. So, I'll follow end AS. This company is turning out to be unlisted and its net worth is 120 crores. If I look at phase 1, 500 crores for unlisted company. If I look at phase 2, 250 crores but less than 500 crores. So, it is having a net worth of 120 crores. So, can I say that this company can follow the existing accounting standards? Right, so it will follow the existing accounting standards. So, we say it is following an existing accounting standard. Here, what will happen is, since your main parent is not following the end AS, you cannot say that C should also follow the end AS. Try to understand this thing very clearly. The relationship between B and C, right, when I look at B and C, they are not parent companies of each other. They are not subsidiaries of each other. They are not associate or joint ventures of each other. So, that earlier rule that we were saying that one company follows India's and everyone will start following India's, that will not happen over here. So, what happens is, this company is following India's based on its individual net worth. And this company will also look at its individual net worth and will decide to follow existing accounting standards. So, you have a very typical situation over here where the main parent is following IFRS for a simple reason that it is not based in India. You have two Indian based subsidiaries. One subsidiary is following NDS because it is listed. Another subsidiary is not following NDS. It is following your existing accounting standards. So, you have a typical situation where all three companies are following a different set of accounting standards. But yes, company A is having 70 percent shares in C. So, you are a parent company. And as a parent company, you can force your subsidiary to follow end AS. We know that NDS can be followed voluntarily, right? So, what will happen is here it will be a very typical situation. You know, when you will do consolidation, you will find it very tough because one company is preparing as per IFRS, another company is preparing as per NDS, third company is preparing as per existing AS. So, how will I now carry out the consolidation? At the time of consolidation, this company will have to prepare a separate set and confirm with IFRS. This company will also have to prepare a separate set and confirm with IFRS. Again, if you are in the accounts department, think of it, you are in accounts department. If you are in accounts department, you will have to keep on wondering, you know, when you are doing the accounting, 
that okay, is this company following NDAs? Okay, let me do it in this way. Okay, this company is not following NDAs, it is following the regular AS. So, let me do accounting in this way. So, this can create unnecessary hardship for us. So, in such a situation, as we know, NDAs can be followed voluntarily. So, you can use your control over this company and ask this company that don't follow existing AS, you better follow end AS. So that at least your subsidiaries are following, both subsidiaries are following the same set of accounting standards. So just to bring about simplicity in your account, you can definitely ask a subsidiary to voluntarily follow the same. Let me make a slight change. Let's say this company is also an Indian company. Tell me, how will things change now? This company is an Indian company. Tell me, how will things change? Company B is a listed company. It will follow NDS. Tell me, what will happen? Company A? NDS, right. And this subsidiary? Also NDS. The moment it becomes an Indian company, everyone will start following the NDS. Right, this is a listed company. Let us say this is an Indian company. I don't even get into whether it is listed or unlisted. Your subsidiary is following NDS and you are also an Indian company now. Now you can't argue, I'll follow IFRS, right? That argument is not tenable. So what will happen now? Subsidiary follows NDS, so the parent will follow NDS. Parent follows NDS then this subsidiary, although unlisted, doesn't have much of net worth, it will also have to follow the end AS. So all three entities will start following the end AS. Everyone, agree still here? Fine. Another thing, and this is again quite important. Once you start following end AS, there is no rollback possible. Right, this is a one-way street. Once you say I follow NDS, the matter ends now. For example, you are a listed company and then you have started following NDS. You don't like NDS, let's say for some reason. So you don't like NDS. You are like that now I want to get rid of this NDS. So what you do is first you reduce your net worth somehow, maybe by buyback of shares or anything. So you reduce your net worth and then you say, okay, now I am going for delisting. So now I will become an unlisted company and you are bringing your net worth below that 250 crores and now you are like that, yes, finally, I don't have to follow NDS. Sorry to disappoint you. You just cannot avoid NDS now. The moment you start following NDS, permanently you will have to now follow NDS. You don't like NDS? Liquidate your company. Oh, that's the extreme step that can be taken. You liquidate yourself and then you can get rid of that NDS. Otherwise, NDS is simply, uh, uh, the rollback of NDS is simply not possible. So, this is something really critical. Rollback not possible. I will tell you, this will give rise to a lot many typical situations. Situations that perhaps, you know, we will not like. But still, you have no choice. Let us say there is company A, it is listed. It buys, let's say, 60% shares in B, which is unlisted. Let us say its net worth is simply 10 crores. That's it. So this is the situation that we have. It's a listed company. Since it is listed, I'm not putting anything for net worth because all those dates have already gone by. So we are just assuming that we are doing a recent analysis. So if I'm doing an analysis right now, if it is listed, tell me. It has to follow end AS. And if A is following end AS, tell me, what about B? No choice. You also have to follow end AS. So B will also start following the end AS. After one year, I don't like this investment, let's say. So what I do is, after one year, I decide to sell away all my shares. So initially, I picked up 60% shares of your company. Now I feel it was not a good buy. So what I want to do is, I want to sell the shares. So what I do is, I sell away all 60% shares. Think of it for a moment. All 60% shares are sold. So now the relationship of parent and subsidiary between A and B is no longer there. So what will happen? The new relationship, you have A and B. That's it. 
Now there is no holding of A in B because all the shares have been sold. A is a listed company, so obviously it has to follow in the AS. And this is unlisted. It has net worth of only 10 crores. Let's assume. Or let's say it has, in one year it has gone up to 15 crores, let's say. So its net worth is 15 crores. Will it have to follow end years or will it now follow existing years? It has to follow end years. Why? You earlier followed end years, right? So now that you have followed end years, now you have to keep on following the end years. So this is what will happen. Once I start following end years, there is just no way in which I can discontinue the use of the end years. So what has company A done? You know, it has left its legacy in our company. So many times we say, you know, the Britishers have gone, but they have left so, uh, sorry and thank you in India. Many times we say it in that way. Similarly, the parent company is gone, but it has left end AS with you. Even if your net worth is only 10 crores, even if your net worth is only 10 lakhs, still you will have to keep on following this complex set of accounting standards. So there is just no way in which we can uh, discontinue or stop applying the end years. So this is true for subsidiary companies, this is true for associate companies. You know I buy 25% shares of your company, I make you now follow end years. After 3 or 4 years, now I feel that we had a very good relationship during this 4 or 5 years. Now I am not interested. I sell away all the shares. But I will, you know, you will remember me forever. I will live in days with you. And you will have to keep on following the end years. So there is just not any way available by, for discontinuing the end years. And see, although we discuss these things, no company will go for liquidation, you know. Just because I don't want to follow end years. Now, no one is going to take such an extreme step. End years are not so complicated or end years is not, you know, something that you just dislike like anything, that you just want to get rid of it. What we are saying is, there is very difficult, uh, there is a lot of difficulty in moving out of the end years once we have started following the thing. Yeah, we have been using this term net worth. So, let us understand what is net worth and when is the net worth to be calculated. Right below that table, they have given you the meaning of net worth. Uh, they are saying net worth is the aggregate value of the paid up share capital and all reserves created out of the profits and securities premium account. After deducting the aggregate value of the accumulated losses, deferred expenditure and miscellaneous expenditure not written off as per the audited balance sheet. And what does it not include? It does not include reserves created out of the revaluation of assets, write back of depreciation and amalgamation. It is a very standard definition of net worth. This is how we normally understand net worth. It is the share capital plus reserves and surplus minus accumulated losses, right? That's how we always uh, talk of it. So you will take the paid up share capital, consider all the reserves which you have created out of your profits. Securities premium is not out of profit, but still we will consider the same. So for the purpose of net worth, we will consider that. And yes, if there are any accumulated losses, deferred expenditure, all that should be deducted. Revaluation reserve will not be considered. So any reserve out of revaluation, that should be ignored by us. And now, this net worth, it has to be calculated on 31st March 14. So if you are an existing company, if your company has been in existence since last many, many years, you will calculate the net worth on 31st March 14. Although phase one, Phase 1 was to kick from 1st April 16 and phase 2 was to kick from 1st April 17. But the government suggested that the net worth should be calculated on 31st March 14. So this notification came out in 2014 and at that time they said you calculate on 31st March 14. Why? So that some preparatory time is available to large companies. For example, let us say on 31st March 14, my net worth is 700 crores. Okay, 
So I already have a net worth of 700 crores. So on 31st March 14 itself I know that see from 1st April 16 I will have to start following the end years. Let's say I am a listed company. We know for listed company on 1st April 16 your net worth should be 500 crores or more. So I already know that the net worth is 700 crores. So this will give me time for preparation. See we don't want to catch large companies unguarded. That all of a sudden you say from tomorrow start following end years. Now that is going to be tough. So what you are doing is you are giving them time to respond to the new set of financial statements. So the moment it is 700 crores, I know as a company that I have to follow the end years. So whatever work is necessary in my company, I'll start doing that particular work. The software has to be updated. Your employees have to be trained. There's a lot of things which are required to be done for applying the end years. So that entire work in your company will start. Let us say there is some company, it has a net worth of, let's say there is some company A, it has a net worth of 700 crores on 31st March 14. And you know what I do? Next year I plan a buyback of shares. Now I want to reduce my net worth. So I plan a buyback of shares and then I bring down my net worth, let us say to 450 crores. So my net worth is 450. Now I argue that see on 1st April 16, your condition is that net worth should be 500 crores or more. Now my net worth is 450 crores. So I will not follow end years. This argument will not be accepted because the cutoff date for your company was 31st March 14. 31st March 14, your net worth is already more than the threshold limit. So you have to follow the end years. So subsequent reduction in the net worth will not help the company. The subsequent reduction, you still have to carry out the application of the end years. So I may keep on reducing it, doesn't matter. Let us say on 31st March 15, this is my net worth. Let us say my net worth turns out to be now only 300 crores. Let us say on 31st March 16, still I cannot avoid phase one application of the end years. Because 31st March 14 was considered to be the first date. So in simple words, we can put it in this way, that when you are checking for net worth, check the net worth on all the three dates, 31st March 14, 31st March 15, 31st March 16. On any one date, if your net worth is 500 crores or more, you are covered in phase one. And by chance, if you are able to avoid phase one, you will not be able to avoid phase two because you are a listed company. And if you are a listed company, phase two is clear. You have to start following the end years. Right. Let's say you are an, uh, say a new company. Let's say you are a new company. If you are a new company, then how will I do the net worth? For example, on 31st March 14, my company itself was not in existence. So naturally, I cannot calculate net worth on 31st March 14. I float a new company. I float a new company on 1st April 16. I float this as a listed company. So I'm still not in phase two where every listed company has to start following the end days. So let us say on 1st April 16, I float a new company. My net worth is turning out to be, let us say, 600 crores. So it's a new company which you have floated and your net worth is 600 crores. Directly you have to start following the end years. So from day one itself you will follow the end years. Any new listed company which is formed now, from day one they will follow the end years. So if you are an existing company, you may get some preparatory time. And if you are, an, if you are a new company, directly you may have to start following the Indian accounting standards. But this net worth condition was there and it was there for existing firms because I should get at least some time to prepare also. So the first date was 31st March 14. If I change the figures slightly over here, let's say here it was 300 crores, then it is becoming, uh, let us say 550 crores, then again it is reducing, let's say to 450 crores. And I just want to know whether I'll be covered in phase one or phase two. 
what do you say? 31st March 14, I am not satisfying the threshold. But 31st March 15, am I fulfilling the threshold? So I will be getting covered in phase 1. I will have to start preparing in AS from 1st April 16. I change the figures again slightly. This is 450 and this is 550. When are you fulfilling the condition? 31st March 16. This is very typical. You will fulfill the threshold limit on 31st March 16 and you will get covered in phase 1. That means from the very next day start following the end years. So certain companies will get preparatory time, certain companies may not get preparatory time. Although one can argue that when your net worth was 450, you were having a fair idea that by the time the year will come to an end, my net worth will cross 500 crores. See, it doesn't happen that only when the year comes to an end, then I come to know, okay, this is my profit. So to that extent, my net worth is increasing. That is not so. Throughout the year, the way you are doing business, you know that by the time the year will end, my net worth will cross 500 crores. So whatever time you are getting during the year, that time you have to utilize for preparation for the end year. In other words, you cannot buy time. You can't argue that I am fulfilling on 31st March 16. Please give me one year so that I can prepare myself for end years. That's not possible. Very next day, start preparing the end. I mean the financial statements as per the end years. Another thing, when you prepare your financial statements, you give not just current year information. You also have to give previous year comparative information. Now, what to do with this previous year comparative information? Previous year comparative information also has to be as per end years. See, I can't do in this way. Current year, I say end years, previous year, existing years. Please bear with me for one year. That kind of financial statement cannot be prepared. So, not just the current year. I also have to redraft my financial statements of the previous year and confirm them as per the end years. This is what is popularly known as transition date. You know, when you say that I will follow end years from 1st April 16, you are actually not following from 1st April 16. Because your previous year figures also has to be as per end years, technically you have transited to end years not on 1st April 16, but on 1st April 15. So my transition date will be 1st April 15 because they have made it very clear. Previous year figures also should confirm as per the end years. So that will turn out to be my transition date. Any company covered in the phase 2, you will prepare or rather you will start implementing from 1st April 17. But your transition date is not 1st April 17. Your transition date is 1st April 16 because I also have to give the previous year information. Yes, if I am a newly formed company, if I am a newly formed company, then the day on which I will apply end years and my transition date, both will be the same, because it's a newly formed company. Everyone comfortable with this entire discussion? So what we are really discussing is the entire roadmap which has been given for application of the end years. The first date was, very quickly, we are just recapitulating and then we start looking into the questions. These questions are all framed from ICAI bulletins on the end years. What the institute is doing is, from time to time, they are issuing clarifications on matters which are raised by different companies. So the questions that we are going to solve, they are all questions given by the institute and their answers are also given. That if this is the situation, what should a company really do? Should it apply the end years? Yes or no? So we just very quickly go through the end years roadmap. First date was 1st April 15, where you could have done it voluntarily. 1st April 16, listed companies, unlisted, yes, phase 1. Listed company, unlisted company, both have same net worth condition, 500 crores or more. And if you are having any subsidiary, parent, associate, joint venture. Fine. Phase 2, 1st April 17. When it comes to listed companies, 
they say less than 500 crores, we will remember as all listed companies now have to follow the NDA. Unlisted? Not more than 250 crores or more, right? So 250 crores or more, less than 500. And then again, that condition is there. Holding company, subsidiary company, joint venture, that condition is definitely there. So that would cover how the NDS is going to be applied. Fine. Yeah, we also have a parallel uh, roadmap for banks and insurance companies and NBFCs also. This is something which will now recently start getting rolled out. It will start from 1st April 18. So if you'll see for 1st April 18, some scheduled commercial banks, all India term lending, refinancing institutions, insurance uh, companies. So these are all going to follow the NDS and that will start from 1st April 18. Similarly, for NBFC also, it is going to happen in two phases. One is phase one, uh, where it will start from 1st April 18. We put a condition over here again of a net worth of 500 crores or more. And again, of course, the holding companies, subsidiary companies, they still have to follow the NDS. And then there are certain NBFCs which are having lower net worth. Those NBFCs will start following from 1st April 2019. So very soon in India, it's not just the companies, even the banking companies, insurance companies, you know, we want that whatever companies are there, they all start following the NDS. We know there are different regulators, so that's the reason we have this issue. For companies, the regulator is SEBI, for that phase one, phase two is already introduced. Banking companies, NBFCs, the regulator is RBI, so RBI has also agreed that even banking companies will start following the NDS. And for the insurance sector, we have IRDA. IRDA has also agreed that this is how the insurance companies will start following the NDS. So if everything goes as per the timeline, by the time it is 1st April 19, we'll have a large number of companies which will be following the NDS. Having said that, still majority of the companies in India are private limited companies. And if they are having lower net worth, we will still have companies which will be following the existing accounting standards. At the same time, we also have proprietary concerns, partnership firms. See, NDS is notified under the Companies Act. So these partnership firms, proprietary concerns, obviously they will still keep on following the existing accounting standards. So never make this statement that soon a day will come when in India there will be only NDS and all the existing AS will be withdrawn, that will not happen. There will always be enough entities which will be following the existing AS and there will also be another set of entities which will be following the NDS. So both the set of financial statements will coexist and both the set of financial statements will be followed by one entity or the other.